Hey, everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is uh, Dave Jones. That's, that's correct. Um, I'm in infra sorry, Cisco's information security team. And um, one of the things that we do is you know, try to secure companies. But um, I got to be involved in the, in the creation of PXGrid to solve some problems. So uh, that's part of the reason I'm here. But the other, part the other reason I'm here is because Berlin's a good time. I promise I won't make any more dad jokes. Um, OK, so today the things I want to go over, um, some of the, the types of attacks we've seen, that usually the ones that make the news. Um, there's some very common threads that started off in 2012. Uh, those were nation state funded. These days, everyone copies that. So there's no way to tell if it's North Korea or not. It's, it could be some dude living down the, the hall from you. So we're going to go over some of those. We're going to go over some controls to break that. But here, the, really our focus today on PXGrade is application development. So we're going to go over those as a background and then get into securing application to application. And then for fun, um, I want to go into some, what more PXGrid can do for you. And I want to tell you that our, the chief information security officer at Cisco, uh, one of the big deals for him is he's been asked to go 50-50 cloud, meaning take half your data off on-prem and stick it off-prem in the cloud. And so he gave a group of us, for instance, the, the, the nice gentleman in the back in the blue shirt, we were given the task, how do you secure, how do you make this as secure as we can do on premise when you have devices that are essentially out in the cloud in the wild and you have computers in the cloud? So that's what we're going to close off with, and it's going to be awesome. Um, first of all, I, I like to put my references on my slides. So at any time, if you see a reference, you, you can track down where this information came from. But Back in 2012, uh, that was one of those times when, it was one of the first times when our CSERT team got information that we, not just about individual laptops being attacked with the same kind of malware, but the coordinated attacks. So for us, that's when the, the, the nation state stuff first started happening. And we were, we were able to see um, access from different nation states, that, like the one in the, um, known as APT12 and APT3 uh, in the, um, the report by that company that's now owned by FireEye. Points for anyone who can come up with what that is. Anyway, we saw that type of traffic coming in our network. And one of the things that happened is there was a phishing attack that came in. And there was a slide that said, sign up for required training. And our CSERT team was able to detect through NetFlow and some other indicators of compromise that about 10% of our system administrators clicked on that. So we started a phishing awareness campaign. And so six months later, I made up a similar phishing thing about training that they need to take and send it to the sysadmin crew, which is about 2,000 people. And again, about 10,000, sorry, 10% 10 of those 2,000 clicked on it. But this time I had, it went to a website I controlled where I was able to interrogate the browser and find out, you know, plugins that were broken that I could have compromised, like with, with Angular when Angular was still active, things like that. So then jump forward another six months and I sent out a, an exact copy of the original fish, the one that came from bad people. Again, I got 10% click through. And out of those 10% all those times, about half of them had plugins that were out of date, and they would have been compromised. So anyway, this is my, how I can scientifically tell you um, that 5% of sysadmins or their laptops are compromised at any given time. And it's so you can then steal other stuff, because sysadmins are awesome. They have access to everything. So. Um, <laughs> no notes, nation state runbook. So really quickly, uh, this, this is what, um, if you haven't seen it before, this is how the infestation lateral movement runbook works. You, you have a user, and users do promiscuous things, like they, not only do they receive really interesting electronic mail messages with interesting stuff to click on, but now we have this malvertising stuff where folks go to le legitimate websites that they trust, um, and there could be advertising that's either jacked up or the person spreading the malware has paid to put that up. Either way, it ends up that there is malware dropped onto this laptop. And sometimes a laptop starts performing funny, and so they call the support desk. So the support person comes in and logs remotely into their laptop with their extended credentials, which allows for malware to be copied from that machine using that account to a server that could be very well hardened and patched itself. You just use the administrator credentials to get in. So that server starts working funny, and then a guy with even more credentials comes by, and you get malware spread throughout your entire data center. And at the time, back in 2012, the stuff that we were targeted with, and most everyone else was as well, 
um, was mostly plugins. And at the time, Flash was a big deal PDF reader. But the thing that I thought was interesting, at the time it was new, the concept of changing malware, like an existing malware, and recompiling it for individual companies. So the, which would generate a unique signature for the tar Intel target, the Microsoft target, the Oracle target, the Cisco target, so that as these are found, and they're reported malware vendors, the person who created it can go, oh, yeah, well, they found that one. Let's kick it up a notch. And so you get a more interesting malware sent. And it was funny, because when I was first presenting this to our CISO, which is better than a CISO, he was saying, they did not compile this just for us. And it's really great when you get to tell an exec, well, actually, I'm right. <laughs> You're wrong. Uh, I said I wouldn't make any more dad jokes, so I'm going to not make any dumb jokes anymore. There's beer at 5.30. OK, another thing that happened um, in the news, this is news last year. And about a year before last year, we were given some information from a government agency that there are some entities out in the world that were looking for ways of how we published our software. Because if they could stick a malware or backdoor in our software, and then that software went out, like say iOS software, there's a backdoor in the ASA code, like for VPN, and it went out to our customers, that was something we call in our internal in assessment of what's bad. We call that a doomsday scenario. So we put some stuff in place to secure our endpoints. But some of the other um, vendors in the valley got actually hit by this. One of the ones that made the press was actually another company's VPN concentrator, where there's a backdoor place in it so you could connect to it. And if anyone wants to guess the name of the company, I will validate that's true or not true. But if no one guesses, I'll keep it to myself. OK, anyway, so just roughly, how it's, this is a redacted version of how we publish software. But like, uh, so we have developers. And they, they check in code to code repositories. And it's part of the, the secure development life cycle. So we can compare as releases go, you know, they, did you stick malware into the, into the image or not? But also just change control. So if, if something happens and the image goes bad, you know, we can look at it. But the other thing we do is we have processes to stick that into a build cluster. Because the, the larger versions of iOS take upwards of 72 hours to compile if you're going to generate a new image. So we actually have a cluster of servers to do that. And once those images are created, the developer who initiated it, and it's supposed to be two, so that there's two people, so you can't make it so if one person's compromised or their account go out. But you know it can happen. But from there, the images are crossed with the metadata of what they're about. And they hit you know, a place where you can go download it yourself. And it also, in our case, goes to our manufacturing. Because when you buy one of our big boxes, it ships with software in it. And that's how it goes. So um, that's generally how our software publishing works. So imagine you wanted to compromise that. First thing you would do is target, oh, so that lateral movement, hey, Matt, that I was talking about earlier, once, once laptops are hit, they, they're, they, they do queries, they being people running using run books, against your AD and other things, looking for people of interest. Like domain administrators is an obvious one. But people who have access to, if you wanted to compromise the build process, you look for developers working on particular projects, because they'll be in mailing lists and other things to give them away. So anyway, if that was someone you were compromising and you found that you got them, that could be an inroad to get to those places. Another one, back to our last slide, was the system administrators who have access to all of these hosts across the board. So if you targeted them, either one of these guys, there's a number of ways where this malware, these images could be compromised. Distribution hosts, these, to get out. And one of the ways that we actually saw people trying to do when they were walking around at our network in 2012 was they looked for username and password that were run by automated systems to push code out. And they looked for those and compromised them. So for instance, there was a, an antivirus product that was used in some of our fleet of laptops that had one account that would push off virus updates. And that one account had administrator access to all those laptops. So you can imagine that's a really great thing to, to, to look for and pick up. Because the administrator access to a fleet of 1,000 hosts, it's a pretty good day at the office for a malware user. Anyway. Um, you get out here, <laughs> compromises the users, and then you know that's when it gets really bad. When when people get viruses, that's you know that's when firings and yelling ats and long days happen. So another thing that's happening to us, the reason I brought up the cloud use case earlier, is we're trying to push half our stuff out to the cloud, and these are a good collection of people we're using. Actually, we're pretty light on the Azure and Google. I just put them in because everyone's heard of them. 
but we're, we're really heavy on the Salesforce and Box, for instance. So like in Salesforce, we do have what we call restricted content in it, which is our most important. The kind of stuff that could, if you had it, could use for insider trading. So imagine you wanted to break into our data in the cloud. You would, after you're compromising laptops as you've done before, this, you'd be looking for a person of interest who had access to these cloud providers. And once you find one, because with that key, that person becomes super in the cloud, and you compromise them, and then you can take over the cloud. And this is what it looks like when the cloud gets taken over. First, a bunch of malware, different things hit the different cloud providers. And then you think, maybe you're OK. You can just clean it up. And then maybe Box will hang. No, even Box is gone. So the whole cloud dis disappears. Um, last use case I want to point out is just basically data exfiltration, because this is something we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, we're going to talk about encryption today. It, encryption made easy for people like me. But one of the things you have to, do, you have to worry about is people going sideways. It's one thing to break into a, a website from the front and try to you know, go cross-site scripting or something else. But if you gain access to the operating system below the application, you're going to go sideways and you're going to grab the whole database file. You're going to grab whole guest VM images, even ones that are running. I did some data exfiltration tests recently, and most of the major hyper, uh, hypervisors on the market uh, while you copy a live virtual machine, 90 some odd percent of the time, the ones I stole, I was able to boot them up. Uh, there, there weren't corruption problems from being able to do that. So this is something we really have to worry about. So same case, um, either one that were compromised, either credentials or the individual, these guys' accounts, and then you get that compromise, and the next thing you know, you have animated data flying out to we don't know where. So uh, just really quickly, because beer comes out at 5.30. A um, couple things we can do for, to remediate this is, you know, first of all, one of the things you can do for people is you have people use smart cards. And you can also do segment, segmented duties or segmentation of access. So that um, the first guy, he, first of all, th this guy that had domain administrator rights, um, Make them log in with a smart card so you can't just steal a static password. And that's a recurring theme today. Get away from static passwords. Use something else. So first of all, he uses a smart card, static access, and that malware is not spread across the data center. And then what we want to do is the, the privileged user logged into the laptop. We want to not allow that to happen. Um, so you set up the segmentation of duties I was talking about, where if you're a laptop administrator, your credential can log into laptops, but it can't log into servers. You use multiple accounts for that. Um, if you're a server administrator, your server account, and this is one that's more likely to happen, cannot log into a laptop, because those laptops are the more likely place that your credential is going to be stolen from. Um, so for instance, you want to have your administrators using secure jump hosts to administer your hosts instead, because you can also establish um, location. And malware is not spread to the data center. And then finally, last thing to do is, you saw I really quickly upgraded from Windows 7 to Windows 10. But locking down the patches of applications, because it's still just this strange stat that once um, an exploit's released, you've got about two weeks before someone can weaponize something to exploit that. But if you patch in that two weeks, it's unlikely that malware is going to work against you. So being aggressive and patching is a good thing, which is why I went from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Um, and then the initial attack fails. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip through this one a little faster, but it's the same concept. Um, just the difference is when you go to check in a build, one of the things we've done is not only do we have two people that have to go check in an iOS build for being built, but if they use smart cards, they can sign the transaction. It's not just that their credentials could be used, but we could have a signed transaction to show that the image was not um, just taken by someone acting. And anyway, we have non-repudiation. We can tell for exact fact that it was Matt and Simon that checked it in. It wasn't anyone else in the room. And look, everyone gets happy. Oh, and I just want to apologize up front. I cut down an hour and a half's worth of material into 45 minutes. I don't think I cut enough. <laughs> so I'm just going to speed through a couple of these. But I just want to, same concept. 
Uh, this is, I call a marketing slide, this is for execs, but this is a similar concept for end users. And one of the things we're doing this year, and it's even become a thing with some of the security researchers that publish, is this bank or this company got broken into, for some reason they're not using multi-factor authentication. So we're actually rolling out a multi-factor authentication product to our end users. It's not as secure as these smart cards, or in our case, we actually, for administrators, we actually use USB tokens that has the, the chips actually inside. It's just an easier thing. They always have a USB reader. But for users, that's a little heavy. But users don't quite need as much protection because they don't have sysadmin rights across the fleet of hosts. So we're deploying one to what we call a trusted device, we'll get to in a little bit, so that using the security of the device itself, like an iOS device, the other iOS, the Apple one, the, we can have the user doing something besides a username and password to log into the other sides. But the other thing we want to be able to do is we have all this stuff in the middle, back to this cloud use case I was talking about, where there's really important information here, and we have a policy that that really important information doesn't go to devices that aren't to a level, we call it a trusted device, with posture level so they can receive that restricted content. So how do you make all that happen? Well, it's almost like you need something that can communicate trust between these two devices. So with that idea, there was an acquisition we did in the last year for a company that does that, that kind of stuff so that a user can, that trust can be out of band. The user can go directly to the host and there's a third party that's talking information about the user, end user's device. This is an icon that means the uh, management system or MDM for the devices as well as the, the posture of the, the cloud server. Because there really are two parts to this, this conversation. Each endpoint has to be secured to get our model of putting important stuff in the cloud. And that's the client endpoint as well as the application endpoint. And um, Matt, this is one of the Easter eggs for our CFRI right there. It's the C-cert picture. Yeah, so um, re just really quickly, if you, if you want to secure administrators' rights to, a to applications inside your company, this is, the, this is what we did. Because you want to establish location. So like you can only log in from a hardened laptop, or you can only log in from a uh, security operations center. Well, that doesn't always work. Sometimes we need our administrators to be remote. So what we did is we established a virtual location or a virtual security operations center for administration. And we did that with what I call an SCP or security configuration point. Um, so that all administrator traffic to get to something important goes through these hosts. These hosts require a smart card. And we have our CSERT team monitoring those more important than we monitor some other stuff. Um, but the, the one thing that this big thing we had to change as a company is previous to this, the way we did administration of all of our infrastructure, whether it was access points, router switches, or hosts, was uh, the same user credential logged into your laptop. You could SSH or RDP to anything and get to it. So we had to set up that boundary using just network ACLs. Like for SSH, can only go to these hosts through that box. So that would be denied. Um, and like most companies, we, we're, well, uh, well, some companies, uh, we're heterogeneous. People are allowed to kind of do whatever they want. <laughs> some people don't like Windows. Some people don't like Linux. I prefer my Unixes to be developed in California, for instance. So I like BSDI or the other iOS. But anyway, we have two different concepts of security control points in our company. And just really quick, the Windows one is really good for GUI stuff. Like this is the vCenter hypervisor logo. vCenter works great on a Windows security control point where if you want to run a script, to manage to make a change to 50 routers at the same time, or in our case, more likely to our iron ports, the ESAs, we do that through a Linux host. So you don't have to go to each one running the same command. So for that, a Linux host with a batch of like even Perl scripts to manage those in one place is a good thing because you can also audit what those are. So that those are the two options inside our company. And finally, the the last one um, that we're rolling out now is to do the same thing for the cloud. So you have you know, Salesforce, for instance, they're just one of our, our big partners, and they, I work with them, and they support a concept that we'll talk to today, which is an assurance level. Um, you, you can tell them assurance level of your end clients, and they will give you different access at Salesforce based on that. But we just took the same concept as before. So in order to log into this Salesforce site, you have to have a security assertion, not a password for administration, but a security assertion, uh, say a SAML document, that 
you can only get that SAML document if you can authenticate to this host. And this host had a, has a policy that you do not hand out administrator security assertions to any host that's not on the security control point subnet. In, or, in order to get to that security control point subnet, you have to have a smart card to log into that machine. So with that, that's how we break the runbook of having our cloud taken over. And with that, we get to the fun part of the conversation. So all the things I just talked about are people having these. But how do you give an application multi-factor? So that's what we get to talk about for the next 20 minutes. And this is going to be awesome. Again. <laughs> so traditionally, the way applications work, if you have an application that's talked to another application, what was commonly done, and I get to review other people's code, and I've gotten complaints before because uh, they, the application team doesn't want to change their username and password every six months. So they ask me for an extension to have it never change. And I'll say, well, let's work on, let's negotiate. You know, we want passwords to change more often. And they'll say, but, um, but the password's in the source code. Uh, if we're going to change the password, I'm going to have to roll this into my code development process so I can change the password in the source code. And sometimes the password ends up in multiple places in the source code. Anyway, this is all a fail. This is not what we want. <laughs> because once again, those credentials that are sitting on this box, say in source code or just sitting on this box, are targeted for use to access this application. Because the thing about that one username and password, it has the rights of every individual user that needs to get to this because they have to be delegated those rights. So, Couple things we can do, but what I tell people if you have to use a username and password is you, you have to put it into a file and you have to protect that file. Like, for instance, um, on a Linux host, have the file be owned by the application where the application's account doesn't have a sh default shell, doesn't have a password in the shadow file, so you can't log into it. So the only way you can ac access that account is having a NIT during boot time start the application on that account or have humans pseudo to it. And those two last things I just said are easy to log through syslog where you can even have alerts on. Because it should be uncommon for someone to pseudo to an application account. It should raise a red flag. But still, this is, this is still poor security for application application communications. What would be even better is if we remove the credential from the application. Because the application shouldn't be holding credentials because they are targeted. So we should give application one, instead of using your password, we should give them some sort of certificate. Now, this is most likely in a file. So in this file, we should apply the same things I was saying to protect that file as the password. But still, the main difference, password you can reuse in a lot of different locations and places, where if you have a credential based on something else, you can limit where it has access to. So if you steal that, you can get to application BB, you can't get to anything else like a password. So it's still better. But even better yet is if you add in another source of trust in there. So this source of trust could be a credential vault. So the application boots up, hands its certificate, like an SSH key even, to this vault. And this vault verifies the IP address that came from, for instance. And if it's right, it can hand a credential to that application. And that credential could be using a password at that point, because it's only stored memory. And that could be used logging across. Or even better, this could be something like a single sign-on server using OAuth tokens which sounds like such a great idea. Let's talk about that for a second. So one of the things I really like to do is give machines, the computers themselves, their own certificates. And it would be really great if we use a hardware anchor for that, which we'll get to in a minute. But even if it's still a file, it's better than the password stuff as before. But let's say we give uh, certificates to each of these two hosts so that those two hosts can establish their own application VPN, which we call TLS so that all communications between these hosts are, are controlled by them. And then you could add in something like an OAuth token flow. So let's say this application needs to log into that one on behalf of this user. The first thing that happens is this user account approves the delegation of that account to that application. So that application can get an OAuth token which is a, a delegated version of Jane Doe. And Jane Doe is from San Francisco. That's why she has a, a short haircut. So that that application has a, a one-time credential to log into that app on behalf of Jane Doe. And then finally, this last server can validate that when that user application hits 
that application on behalf of that user, it can check that centralized single sign-on server to verify that's the right person. But how do you make that easy? That all sounded so complicated. I kind of lost what I was saying there, too. Actually, I didn't. I just, just, if you <laughs> so, all right. Best practice, PXGrid. PXGrid has a lot of the capabilities built into it, so it can do the same kinds of things. And now with group chat. So for instance, PXGrid has processes built into it. Um, because a lot of times when I tell people, you need to do certificates to you know, establish TLS connections between your hosts, or just anything, they'll say, where do I double click to get that certificate for my host? And I'll say, well, and then everything after that is just complicated. So one of the neat things about PXGrid is it facilitates that being put in. Because PXGrid was written on top of XMPP, the chat protocol. Joe Salloway is a friend of mine. Was, he was the IETF chair for TLS, and he helped get that stuff in. But we also put stuff in to make it easy in PXGrid to get a cert. There's sample certs that ship with it that you can use in ICE, for instance. There's a, you can generate your own. And it's an e there's an easy way to go out and do the right thing, like even go out to somewhere like letsencrypt.org and get free certs that you can use for this communication. But back to that in a minute. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard of PXGrid yet, PXGrid was born out of a couple use cases. But the general idea was, like say our company, we have all these different networking products that have information about what's going on in the network. You know, this one's got MDM info. Um, that's, that's actually sender-based. For a while, it was called SIO. It's not anymore. Um, hard to keep track. Netflow information. Bunch of different things. So people said, you know, like our IT staff said, well, we need to manage that. Let's share all that via proprietary APIs which kind of looks like this. You know, the red is going to connect and talk about user information. The blue is going to talk about threat data. Except that just didn't work very well. Um, because all those point-to-point -point connections with proprietary APIs just aren't good. Which is where the grid came from. Uh, the idea being, if you could establish one grid framework, like a chat protocol for applications, all they, each one of them have to do is connect to the grid and there's a grid controller that's not on this slide. And they get that third-party validation from the grid controller, which ICE is a shipping version of that. There's others. And once you're inside the grid, you can do secure communications to any one of the folks. You can also advertise services you have and subscribe to other people's services. That's that group chat thing. So like, oh, I, I've already summarized what it can do. The, the TLS XMPP, it's great. Um, so a uh, really quick PXTrade use case is um, this one. So we have most of us log into wireless networks or plug directly into very old switches um, over 802.1 authentication, the end user getting on the network. That, if that device is connected to the ICE server and the ICE server actually did the authentication, if ICE is plugged into PXTrade, which it is, because it's a, it is a, a, an official grid controller, and then you have Fireside Insight Manager, F sorry, <laughs> Firesight Management Center plugged into PXGrid. When it's doing the analytics stuff on its sensor, it can get all kinds of additional information like from the last slide. But a common thing that we want is session ID information from the AP or switch the user connected to, or just basic information about who the user was on that session so that they can all be tied together. Or what I really want to see is let's say I have a user on a device, and that user wants to get to uh, an application that has really important information in it, except this application was told, don't let anyone connect that's not a trusted device. So with the PXGrid concept, um, ICE has the ability to talk to MDMs to get information about what is installed on a trusted device. And trusted device, I have a slide on in a minute. But it, it means it's secure. And so with PXGrid, you can exchange that kind of information. You can establish a device trust channel. So as that device connects to the, the, the trusted service, the application, it can make the trusted service can communicate over PXGrid and find out information about that end device. So and here's the good part about PXGrid. <laughs> here's one of the good parts. Uh, it's really easy to get started. Um, there's stuff on the DevNet site. Um, I have a link to it later. But you can download not only the, the, the PXGrid SDKs for uh, 2x or 1x, but they come with even born shell scripts so that you can test that it all works. And the examples are in Java as well as C. All the examples I'm going to show today are Java. 
just because it's almost like a pseudocode. It's not as complicated. <laughs> um, but anyway, you can, um, there's not only you can set up the certs in this demo, you can also establish communications and test it. And like I said, it's with Born Shell scripts. And I always call out that they're Born Shell scripts because I know Steve Born. Um, but here's an example of one of the ones that comes in the, in the developer kit. Session query by IP. Um, so in this command line, that's the ICE server you're connecting to, um, demo pass, certs. Then I'm just skipping over these details. But you can run this shell script. It'll connect, and then it'll show the information that you were querying for. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it, I, my point is, it's a, it's a really easy way to get set up with PXRay to know that it works. And there, there's a couple of these. Like This is the actual called source code in it. And one thing about PXGrid, besides when you, when you connect, there, there is the concept. This was all written with um, factory pattern. So a lot of this stuff is pretty easy. So you only have to you know, two lines to do the connection. Factory pattern handles connecting all the different stuff, like that TLS, establishing TLS connections and all those things. So that's all you have to know to do. There's also code that I snipped out for doing reconnects. Like if you get disconnected, you can automatically reconnect. But the whole thing of just querying by an IP address just comes down to get active query session by IP. Um, you can also download the entire session directory. And there's a, a shell script to do the, the same thing. And just the interesting thing on this one is in, t in the entire session, I snipped a lot of this out. But you can look at it like in this one, there's a username on this end device, John Epic. He works for Cisco. <laughs> and he's from an end client. And so like, there's a username, John Epic. This username is a MAC address because this is the actual ICE server itself. And this is yet some other device on the network. But the other thing to be aware of is this is that session ID that's available across those user sessions that would be maintained across every router and switch they hit in the network. So a lot of times, it's that session ID that you want to use to get information out. And once again, the called source code to make that whole thing happen was really just get session by time, and it will give the, you the entire table. And there's a couple of those tables inside ICE that you can pull down. And um, one of our things that, I, that we're excited about with, with the whole ICE concept is the, the idea of, of quarantining. So I'm just going to skip why you'd want to quarantine a device. But the idea of being able to do it and have that be persistent, and I have an example in a little bit. So it's not just like restricting this device's quarantine can't get on the wireless network. It'd be, wouldn't that be better if you could quarantine a device and they couldn't then just pull in an Ethernet cable and plug it in to bypass the quarantine of wireless? W wouldn't it even be better if that laptop walked to a coffee shop completely off your network and it was still quarantined getting to the cloud? That would be cool. And this is how you want, you want to do it. Um, yeah, 33 minutes in. We have 10 minutes. I think this will work. Um, so one of the things inside, uh, there is a DevNet session that you can pull down. We were set up with this in Las Vegas. I don't know if it's set up this year. But you can, oh, you're getting, OK. <laughs> That's Simon Finn, by the way. <laughs> um, so this is something you can actually set up and test with PXGrid. And it's called the auction. And so you can set up and ask a grid controller to create a new chat channel for computers called the auction. And then you can set up clients to use it. So in this particular example, you have three entities. You have a grid controller, which in this case is an ICE host. You have bidders. You have watchers. Oh, I should have said it the other way around. You have a seller who has a database of everything that they want to sell in an auction. And then over PXGrid, these bidders can query for the entire list inventory of what's being auctioned. And they can also send actual bids. And then there's other clients that are connected called watchers that can just watch the entire transaction. And you, you can set this, this up in, I think it takes 7 to 12 minutes. Um, but the, end, um, the actual code called um, to create a new chat channel is, is this. Proposed capability, and I say proposed because there's a government governance feature in it. So when you propose a new channel, the auction channel, if you go into the, the ICE engine, you'll see these are the different um, PXGrid channels that it ha I hope the beer's good. Um, channels you have. And when it pops in there, it requires an administrator to do a workflow to approve that for communications, but you can do. And then finally, on that one, I just point out that in order to subscribe to a channel, a picture channel, there really isn't a lot you have to do. You basically, after you establish your connection, you ask to be added to that with callbacks. 
Um, so uh, just for a few minutes, I, I was saying that, it, that um, ICE makes it really easy for PX Credit Security Communications. There is a registration page for certificates inside ICE. So you can, like, like it says, you can use the samples. Certs are built in, you can generate your own, or you can get real ones. But putting them in a registering with ICE is something that can be done in less than a minute through this registration page. And um, I've already gone through this, so I'm going to just skip this. Oh, except for this. Um, the default, and this is something you need to know in all the ICE examples, is the default for a key store, or JKS is just the Java version of a key store, is a file where your certificates are in. So you have to worry about protecting them, like I was talking about earlier. Unless you have a hardware. And they, we, PXRED now supports the concept of an SSL context, so you can set the context to a hardware device. And this is just saying the stuff I said earlier, so I'm going to skip. And this is that example. So out of these hardware devices, hardware devices are things like hardware security modules, uh, TPM chips, which there's a TPM chip in this that secures the pin or the biometric templates for logging to this. But inside your um, PXGrid code, you, and this is a regular Java thing, you can set the SSL context to, in this case, TLS 1.2 and Luna provider. Luna is one of the two major HSM vendors. It's the one that we use for our stuff. Uh, Tails or Talus is another one. But it's as simple as that. And the harder ones, are quite a bit more secure than the others because they're harder to steal. So um, what more can PXGrid do for me? Well, like, like I was saying, PXGrid can enable this to happen. And just a little bit more detail on that, and this is really the side I want to get to. Um, so the idea with the hardware anchor being better than files, the thing that I love about it is if you have a hardware device to secure your certificates, when you have a certificate created, this, this, is, this is an icon for a Luna SE, SE um, HSM. You tell it, generate a certificate that I want to get approved. When it generates that, it's in hardware. It, the private key never leaves, so it's not sitting in a file somewhere. It can then do cryptographic operations, but it can also allow other applications and hosts to store their cryptographic operations, or sorry, keys, you know, asymmetric encryption keys or else public-private keys, stuff like that, in this device. And it gives you the ability to do a few things. This is the icon I made up for a secure boot. Um, but secure boot, it works a lot better when you have a hardware device validating, a third-party device validating that the stuff as it's going through the boot sequence, and this is something I pulled out, like the difference between FPGAs and UEFI. Either one of those requires a hardware anchor to make sure the secure boot works right. Just trust me on that. If you want additional details, I should have said this earlier because I crunched all this down. I'd be happy to talk to anyone in detail about that. But you can get secure boot with this. So you know when the host is running, there was not a BIOS infection with malware because I don't know if you're all aware of it. But and to infect the BIOS of computers like, say, this one, a lot of times you can run a BIOS utility, and you don't even have to have privileged operating system access on the laptop to compromise the BIOS of a system. Anyway, the other thing that's really neat you can do with a hardware anchor like this is you can protect your own data files. So this is my icon for there are files on this host that are encrypted. And they, and they could be encryption keys themselves for scalability, or they could actually be data files. And th this is actually a service that we're, we're standing up. Um, but the idea is we have a, an array of these HSMs. We have a way of getting to them, and then we have applications. So the thing that I get called on, I get escalations inside our company to help secure. Like when someone says, I have a database file. It's 18 gigabytes. It's just bigger than a couple K. Um, and I need to secure that from someone trying to steal it sideways or, or which way or the other. So through these services, and I'm going to show you this much source code in a minute to do this, but you can generate, you can have, ask an HSM byte, by a few bytes at a time to encrypt stuff for you so you never actually see the encryption. Or what we often do is have it encrypt an encryption key so that you can have an asymmetric key sitting in your, the memory of your applications, which actually could do the scalability of encrypting a very large data files or even pieces of data files with code like this. Um, in this, I'm, I'm at, asking the HSM for an AES encryption key. 
And then here, I'm asking it to encrypt my data file a piece at a time. And this is the kind of thing that could be done at scale. Anyway, you put all that together, and this is what I call a trusted service or a trusted application, um, where I've got my, my, trust, my hardware anchor to do secure boot. Uh, th this is my idea of a deck. This is a, this is a hypervisor. My hypervisor in my lab is actually called deck. <laughs> Uh, not very creative. And then you have secure hosts on it. But the other thing those need is federated trust to your, your information sharing, PXGrid, to get information about clients. And finally, I'm just skipping over this because I'm assuming this is, this is a, a use case that is well known, is like the OWASP top 10. How do you secure your application front end? I'm assuming that everyone's been versed on that. <laughs> so that's there. Anyway, you put all these things together and you have a trusted service. Then you need a trusted, trusted endpoint. And I, oh, this, this is actually one this laptop happens to be. But when I say trusted device, in order to access our really important stuff, you have to have some really important things in it. Now with a trust anchor. Well, that one does. Yours doesn't. But um, a trusted device should have remote wipe. It should have data encryption at rest. It should absolutely require some sort of a pin to authenticate. And it's even better if that authentication is local. So like in the case of mine, I have a, my TPM chip in there is what my pin goes into. So you can't steal my pin across the network from a central service. You have to actually steal that laptop to try to get to it. But you have all the other stuff you expect, like the automatic patching I was talking about, secure boot, and stuff. So you have those, put those together. And so, we're, gonna say, we're just going to say Salesforce is a trusted service, like I just outlined. They've got a little bit of work to do. <laughs> but let's say they are. And let's say I have my, my device that's my trusted device. So what you wanna pull, we want to pull all this together so we can feel comfortable by having our most important data here and only giving access to those laptops. And so my laptop, in practice, on a regular basis, will connect to my MDMs, which are managing it, making sure it's patched, make sure all the controls are in place are supposed to be, so that when I do my normal single sign-on flow, when I go to go to Salesforce, the only way I can get a, a SAML assertion to log into Salesforce is through my IDP. And my IDP has the ability, via PXGrid, to talk to the MDMs, well, actually talk to ICE who talks to the MDMs, to get information about the device. But then it can take that same information, and I was saying earlier, Salesforce has the concept of an assurance level for you can put into a SAML assertion. They, they developed this for one of the banks, I can't remember which one, which, and it's good I can't remember because I probably shouldn't tell you. But anyway, you can put an assertion level into that SAML assertion so that when a user gets to Salesforce, if they are on a trusted device, they're allowed to see next quarter booking information, which for us is a big deal. Or if they're not on a trusted device, they don't get to see that, but they do get to do the other stuff, like schedule a, uh, an executive briefing tour with the customer, things like that. But anyway, you put that together, and you got a pretty good concept. Like Only official users can get to Salesforce. But then you add in that quarantine concept. Because that's the killer app, quarantine in the cloud. So let's say Matt's team determines that this device went from being cool to compromised. Matt's team triggers that thing that says, quarantine this device. So like I was saying, it wouldn't just be quarantine from the, the wireless on-premise, wired on-prem, but we could actually have this host subscribing to PXGrid, the quarantine channel, and it could pick up the quarantine of this device, and it could send calls to Salesforce's API to terminate all sessions from that device. So, and that just gets around this problem that we've had for years. Like I was saying, you have a user's device gets compromised, they have problems with it, and they're like, screw this, I'm leaving the office. And they go to a coffee shop, and they can get to all the cloud stuff with a compromised state. With this stuff in place, you wouldn't be able to do that anymore. And that, that was totally awesome if, if you didn't know. <laughs> anyway, I, thank you for bearing with me. I just squeezed a lot of information into 45 minutes. Um, I'm willing to take questions. Does anyone, are, does anyone have a question? <laughs> um, well, again, thanks for coming. There is... I, oh, I should probably put my email up here, but DaveJ at Cisco.com. I'm willing to take uh, questions over email or even set up meetings with y'all or your, your coworkers to go over some of these things in more detail. 
But besides that, um, there is beer next door. Um, please enjoy it. And thanks, thanks for coming.